Good evening. May I first ask you to turn off cell phones if you have them with you? My name is Molly Anderson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Nantucket Athenaeum. I want to welcome you tonight to the Constance Lane Hayes Memorial Lecture. This is our ninth annual lecture, and I want to welcome you as well on behalf of the Lave and Hayes family members, many of whom are here tonight. Um, also, books written by tonight's speakers will be for sale and for signing in the lobby after tonight's presentation. And finally, I'd also like to send a special thanks to Jackie Cooper, who was so instrumental in helping us get tonight's speakers. Thank you. And John Hayes is with us tonight, and he's going to introduce our speakers. Please join me in welcoming John Hayes. Great pleasure to be back for our ninth lecture evening. And I'd like uh, uh, just to thank uh, Ann Lay and Molly Anderson because uh, the two of them conceived uh, our, uh, the evening uh, that we're having tonight. And uh, a lot of credit goes to them, and we'll see why in just a few minutes. Uh, we are we are very honored to have two distinguished uh, speakers, Stephen Shepard and Lynn Povich. Now, it's not traditional to take a pot shot at your speakers as an introducer, <laughs> uh, but I can resist uh, a very short story that uh, Connie uh, used to love to tell, uh, because we have two distinguished editors here in Zealand. And uh, as a young writer, you know, editors fall into a certain category. Uh, and Connie used to tell the story of, of the two men in the desert, a man and a woman, uh, clawing their way through the sands looking for, for, for some sustenance, and they spot an oasis. And they cheer and they drag themselves to the oasis, and one jumps into the water, and uh, that they find and he's drinking and then he hears a, a trickling noise behind him. He looks up and the other uh, person is peeing into the oasis. And uh, he, the man in the, in the oasis water, looks up and goes, what are you doing? And uh, the other says, I'm making it better. <laughs> <laughs> so to have two editors here tonight, it strikes me as, uh, I'm not sure what Connie would, would say, except having said all of that, we have two exceptions to, to the rule, because first of all, uh, introducing two speakers is a little bit difficult, but I'll just start by saying that uh, Steve Shepard, who you all could be in your program, is his bio, I'm not going to read that, um, but as the Dean of the CUNY uh, Journalism School, um, it, it's been such a proud moment for us to have uh, been involved with two scholarships at CUNY. We've been going to the graduation uh, programs at CUNY, and so we read his book, Deadlines and Disruption, which I have now read. Uh, we won't be able to put it down. I'm not just trying to sell it, but it tells you the story of, uh, you, you start with a quote, uh, that uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald was, there are no second acts in American lives. Well, he, Steve, is, is not only good to prove that there's only your second act, there'll be more acts to come, but it's a phenomenal story of uh, a journalism school that had a great opportunity to rise uh, in the face of bigger names and bigger places and has become one of the leading journalism schools uh, in the country. And having attended many of the graduations of the Lake family, and having met many of the uh, journalists uh, who got to start there, it is all inspiring. So we're especially honored uh, to have Steve here tonight. 
And then uh, Lynn, who I've uh, met more recently, um, I will also tell you Connie's favorite story about not being given uh, front stories uh, on a silver platter when she was a reporter of the New York Times. Um, never bothered her. She used to say to me, John, it's the story of our life. We just go to the back door and get the real story from the people who work in the, in the White House or who work at the State Department. And uh, we know how to get a story. But it made me think a great deal about what it was like to be a woman uh, uh, working uh, in, in, in a, a male dominated journalism world. But Lynn tells a story and, uh, that's is also all inspired. So these two books must be under some of Bee Tree. And uh, that is my introduction. So without further ado, I'm going to say, please welcome Lynn Povich and Steve Shepard. Uh, to Gender discrimination. 
They were protesting a system in which all the writers and editors were men, and the women were relegated to lower paying jobs like fact checkers and researchers with little opportunity to uh, advance. Lyndon was the only woman writer at Newsweek at the time, a junior writer writing about fashion only because the men didn't want to do that job. But she quickly joined the suit, the fifth woman to sign up, and soon became one of the ringleaders. The suit was the first gender discrimination suit in the media world. It changed her life, paved the way for the next generation of women, and became a milestone in the women, women's movement. Lynn was ultimately named the first woman senior editor in Newsweek. And when I got to Newsweek as a senior editor in 1976, Hers was the only woman's voice in the editorial meetings. It was largely because of her that Newsweek took on many pioneering stories about women and family issues, such as who's raising the kids. Many years later, Lynn realized that the landmark Newsweek suit was fading from memory, as if it had all been a bad dream. Good dream. Young women, even those newly enfranchised at Newsweek, didn't know about the suit and were only dimly aware of what the world was like for working women in the 1960s, when even the help wanted ads in the New York Times was segregated by gender, help wanted male, help wanted female. So she thought initially of sending the papers related to the suit to the writer of the library, which wanted them for their archives. But she realized that unless she wrote a narrative, the papers that by themselves wouldn't make a lot of sense and would just get gathered dust. So she set out to tell the story for herself, for our children, Sarah and Nick, and for future generations. She wanted to portray the context of the Mad Men era of the 1960s and to show what the world was like for women in the workplace. She wanted to flesh out the story with the vivid characters who played a role. People like Catherine Graham, whose Washington Post company owned Newsweek, and who, when she was informed of the suit, famously said, whose side am I supposed to be on? People like Otto Cornelia, the patrician editor of Newsweek, who responded to the suit by saying that the gender roles at Newsweek were, quote, a news magazine tradition that dated back 50 years. But Oz, to his great credit, soon saw the light, in part, perhaps, because he had three daughters. People like Eleanor Holmes North, their first daughter, who was seven months pregnant when she took on the case. And of course, the courageous women themselves, raised to be good girls in the 1950s and 60s, who decided to fight. The book also features three young women at Newsweek who in the course of writing about contemporary issues facing women, discovered the 40-year-old lawsuit, met with Lynn and others involved in the case, and came to a whole new understanding of feminism and their continuity with Lynn's generation. I'm not at all biased in understanding. So I can safely say that Lynn has written a wonderful book that speaks vividly of time and place, of a nation in the throes of social change, and of the men and women caught up in it. I have read the book many times at various stages. It is funny in some places, heartbreaking in others, full of truths large and small, and very, very moving. It always brings tears to my eyes. I hope you all enjoy it. So, Steve's book, Deadlines uh, and Disruption, is, like mine, a book about transition. It's the passage of a working class kid from the Bronx who rises to the top of the magazine world, of how he built Business Week into one of the world's best and most lucrative magazines and helped to reinvent business journalism, presiding over some of the most important stories of the day. It's the transition of Steve as a journalist from the traditional world to the digital world. And it's a microcosm of the larger struggle within journalism to come to terms with the digital reckoning. It's also a saga of how Steve, at 65, launched a brand new graduate school of journalism for a new era at the City University of New York. 
Initially, Steve thought of his role as founding dean as a personal capstone, a chance to pass his experience on to the next generation. Instead, as the journalism world changed, he was the one who became the student. In the beginning, to Steve, the new world seemed upside down. In the traditional world, journalists took great pride in acting as the traditional trusted gatekeepers, professionals who filtered the news for you, who shifted through the glut of information to tell you what was important and why, and who uncovered stories you wouldn't think of asking from a Google search. And suddenly, the traditional model was shattered. The people formerly known as the audience could now talk back. In fact, anyone could be a journalist, or at least commit an act of journalism on their blog or on their website. And then, all of a sudden, there was something called Twitter and something called Facebook. So as journalism became decentralized, the professionals were dethroned. It was a psychic shock, a loss of, of esteem, as well as a loss of livelihood for many, many people. Steve, in, in the beginning, his instinct was to be defensive, to protect the world he knew and he treasured. And only gradually did he realize that digital technology would enrich journalism, create an interactive multimedia form of storytelling that invited community participation that could be personalized and could be delivered on a vast array of devices and could be consumed globally and distributed through social media. And so slowly, Steve finally managed to embrace the changes necessary to create a new school for a new age. Two years ago, Steve decided to write about how he started the CUNY Journalism School. But he really didn't write about the school without writing about himself, who he is, what his background and values are, and why he was selected to be the first dean. It turned into a full-blown memoir, always personal and very revealing. The CUNY Graduate School of Journalism today is one of the top major journalism schools in the country. It is also the only publicly supported graduate school of journalism in the entire Northeast. And nearly 40% of its students are minorities and immigrants. So I never doubted Steve would build the top-notch school. I'm only surprised and pleased that he did it in six years. So for an old guy, Steve is pretty optimistic about journalism in the new world. And he's excited about the platforms where good journalism can be found. But what concerns him is how quality journalism will be financially supported in the digital age. Ah, uh, the business model question. And the last quarter of his book deals with these critical issues. And he'll be talking about that tonight. Will the new technologies enhance journalism or water it down to 140 character tweets? Is Google good for journalism or eroding its foundation economically? What role will Facebook play? And will the news industry live up to its responsibility to forge a well informed public? It's what Steve does best tackle the critical issues facing journalism, synthesize them, and give us his wisest judgment on what's really important. I'm also biased. But Deadlines of Destruction is not only a marvelous memoir, it's a really important book about quality journalism and its future, and therefore of concern to all of us who care about an informed democracy. I hope you enjoy it. Okay. So now we get a chance to interview each other, and I will start by asking Lynn a bunch of questions. Um, and then she will turn the tables on me, and then we will invite you to participate uh, and ask us questions about anything we've said or even things we haven't said. So, first of all, uh, people always want to know, how did you get 46 women organized to sue their bosses without anyone finding out? And weren't you afraid of losing your job? Yeah, we, we were pretty terrified as we were doing this. It, 
as you know, once you file a legal complaint, you're protected from being fired. But until you file one, they could fire you at any moment. And we figured, being the lowest employees on the masthead, that they would be happy to follow, fire all of us. Um, I can only say that um, as we were organizing in the offices, the place where we met and talked about this was the ladies' room. It was the only place we knew we were safe enough to discuss this. And in fact, the editors did not know until the day we sued that this suit was coming down the pike. Um, but people were afraid, and uh, all I can say is rather than courageous, we were probably around 20, average age of 25, we were young, we were unafraid, it was the 60s, we thought if they fire us, we'd get another job. And ultimately, I think what gave us the courage to do this was that we realized it was illegal to discriminate, to segregate jobs by gender according to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So once you realized they were doing something illegal, we felt morally justified to do the right thing. Tell us a little bit about Catherine Brown. Um, what was her role in all this, and was she supportive of the women in the end? You know, we were hoping Catherine Graham would be supportive because she was one of two women who owned news organizations at the time, the other being Dolly Schiff, who owned the New York Post. Um, Catherine Graham inherited the Washington Post company, the Washington Post company owned Newsweek. And there were women among us who wanted to go to Catherine Graham and not sue to appeal to her as a woman to support us in making these changes. But when we sued, and as Steve said, the first reaction was, whose side am I supposed to be on? She was torn. Um, she was, first of all, the owner of a magazine that was being sued. So she was concerned about that. On the other hand, she was one of the few women publishers who were not treated well by the male publishers that she saw at various meetings and conferences. But if you read her marvelous autobiography, Personal History, which is a great book, she was a woman who was quite insecure growing up. Her mother was quite critical, her father underestimated her, um, and she had to step in after her husband died to run a company. And she said at the time, I think a man would be better at this job than I would be. So when we asked her to come and negotiate with us, hoping that in the first negotiation she would come and listen to our case. She refused to do so. And we ultimately um, had to sue a second time in 1972 because very little progress was made. And by that time, she met Gloria Steinem. And Gloria, she says in her book, personally explained to her about feminism, about the women's movement, and about the rights of women. And so by the time we sued the second time, she told her corporate lawyer at the time, a man named Joe Califano, who later became the secretary of HEW under President Johnson, she told him to go up and settle the suit. Fine. Fine. Um, this all happened before I got to Newsweek, but tell me, were there any good guys at Newsweek at the time, or were there all a bunch of chauvinist pigs? You know, there are a lot of good guys at Newsweek. Uh, who supported us. Uh, you know, each of us worked with a writer. Each, fact, each writer had a fact checker researcher. So we worked with a lot of writers and reporters, and many of us went to the same schools they did. We did a lot of reporting for them. We fact checked their stories. They knew that we were capable, that we were smart. And they were very supportive once we filed the suit as one of them said, oh my god, I just realized, you know, what we had been doing for the women at, at the magazine. But like many organizations, I think the discrimination happened on the mid-level, mid-management. Uh, there were senior editors who were quite hostile. Many men were against affirmative action, if you remember that, and felt that the only reason people were being promoted is because they were a woman or because they were black. Um, the editor-in-chief, Osborne Elliott, as you said, was very supportive um, and committed to make change. This was a man who, uh, edited Newsweek who uh, uh, came out for civil rights and against the war in Vietnam. He told me later when I interviewed him that he realized that Monday we announced the lawsuit that of course the women were right. And here he had been this progressive man for all these other people 
and yet right under his nose he had been oppressing this whole class of women that I just didn't think about it because that was the society in which he was raised and in which we were raised. So you became the first woman senior editor in Newsweek's history. What difference did it make to you and to Newsweek if you say? Well, to me personally, of course, you know, once you go and get into a management job, it changes your life because now you're at a level where other people see you as a manager, you get other job offers. Uh, management sees a woman who can do it, and therefore they start to look at other women differently. If you're the first of any sort and you manage to accomplish something, then they realize, you know, this can, this is possible. I certainly advocated for stories that weren't being suggested otherwise, that came up from other women whose stories were perhaps not advocated for before. I advocated for other women getting promoted. And many more women started to get promoted in this week after I became senior editor. They became the White House correspondent or a war correspondent, um, for which they had been denied before. But I think, in addition to Newsweek, our lawsuit inspired journalists at other organizations. Three months after we sued, because we sued, the women at Time Magazine, the women at Fortune Magazine, and the women at Sports Illustrated all sued. And then the women at the AP, at NBC, at Newsday, at the New Haven Register, and ultimately the New York Times, who hired one of our lawyers, all these women filed sex discrimination lawsuits against their employers. So it had a huge ripple effect. Yeah. What, what problems do you think remain for women in the workplace today? I'm thinking, of course, that two categories in a way, women who have children or child um, responsibilities and women who don't have children. So talk about that. Um, you know, the obvious are pay and equity. We know that women still are underpaid. Um, we know that there's a glass ceiling at the very top. It's 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. I, I think it's 14% of Fortune 500 for women comprise 14% of Fortune 500 board members. I think the statistic that is the most discouraging is 18% of the corporate suite are being this female. And 18% of Congress, 18 to 19% now of Congress, is female. And what's discouraging is it's not only 18%, but it's been 18% for the past 10 years. So something's happening. We're stalling out at 18%, even though, as we all know, women are highly educated, come into the workforce, they're skilled, they're talented, they're trained. So something really bad is happening. For women who are who have children or about to have children, first of all, if you read the story the other day, pregnancy discrimination is now on the rise. More and more women who are having children and coming back to work are being discriminated against, given lesser jobs, treated badly. Um, it's become an issue again. Um, but I think the issue in the workplace is not just a female issue. I think it's an issue for working men. Because today, if you're, if you're, both of you are working and you have kids, you are working all the time. The technology has made it worse. It's very hard to be available to your family when they're expected to be constantly on a device. And I think men of this generation, I have a lot of hope in the men for this generation, want to be far more involved in raising their children than perhaps my father's generation was. So they're suffering too. You know, they take flex time. They're penalized. They're stigmatized. They're seen as less serious about their careers, even when there is some paternity leave. And women are leaving the workforce for for short periods of time, or taking less demanding jobs because they can't be good mothers and good bosses at the same time. It's very difficult. And I think one of the reasons there are not more women at the very top is that women who would naturally take those jobs because they're ready and skilled and talented don't want to take on that level of stress and responsibility when they have children at home. So I think that's the real issue. Uh, and one last question. Where is feminism today? You know, it's interesting. Uh, 
most of us think sort of feminism has died down because we don't see it. You know, the feminist movement of the second wave, which I was part of, was very visible. You know, we were protesting in the streets and we were always um, haranguing and doing things like that. Uh, you don't see it now because actually feminism, like everything else, is online. So if you know the right websites, the right women to follow, the right listservs to get, you see a huge discussion of feminism going on among young women um, with issues ranging from reproductive rights to sexual harassment to rape on campus. Um, everything is being talked about and petitions are being uh, signed and sent and, and there's been some success, some success in things like getting Facebook to take down misogynistic uh, things that are being said on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, but it's very interesting to me because, of course, the word feminism has gotten to be, among the young gen younger generation, not as appealing as it was to us. I mean, we were proud to be feminists. For us, it meant, you know, just equal opportunities for everyone. Um, and I think young women see a much more complicated role for women today, um, partly because um, they see it not just as a women's issue, but what is now called, if you're familiar in academia, as intersectionality, which is you can't talk about gender without talking about race, without talking about class. And so this then changes the conversation a lot from just solely being, oh, and gender identity, meaning LBGT, which is a huge issue on campuses today. So it's a different kind of conversation, but it's definitely a lot as well. Okay, I'm all words. Okay, so very simply, why have newspapers had such difficulty in making this transition? Well, their business model has collapsed. Let me just give you one statistic. Between 2005 and 2012, newspapers in America lost 60% of their print advertising revenue. That's $28 billion of company. People thought, well, all right, so people moving to the internet, the advertisers would move online as well. It didn't happen. In that same period of time, only two billion newspapers in America got only two billion dollars more in uh, digital advertising revenue. So they had twenty-eight billion dollars going out, and only two billion dollars coming in, and that is not exactly a sustainable business model. So, what do they do to fix the advertising? Well, most people think that uh, print advertising newspapers will continue to decline. So they, and it is, so they are focusing on digital advertising. The problem here is that the um, rates that digital advertising fetch are about one-tenth what print advertising gets um, to a comparable audience. And you've probably all heard the expression that print dollars have been replaced by digital dollars, and that's about why. So the whole game now is figuring out ways to get advertising rates higher online. Um, and there are several approaches people are taking. First of all, video advertising uh, seems to command higher rates from advertisers. So that's why you see a lot of uh, newspapers building television studios in their newsrooms and are providing video content, partly because it's a good thing to do, but partly because it also attracts um, uh, video advertising at higher rates. The second thing is something called native advertising, uh, which is a kind of sponsored content that we used to do in newspapers and magazines, and it was called special advertising sections, advertorials. And it's, it's kind of storytelling kind of content, except it's paid for by an advertiser. And advertisers are paying more for it. The trick here is that they have to be labeled so that readers are not confused about what's editorial and what's um, and the third thing is about targeting. You know, the internet is a wonderful medium for personalization uh, and targeting people based on their demographic profile and their interests and their um, reading habits on the web, their buying habits on the web. And newspapers are trying to find more direct ways to target readers for both content and advertising. And that's why it's so interesting to see what Jeff Bezos is of Amazon is going to do. He bought the Washington Post about a year ago at a fire sale, basically. And um, he's been working to improve it, both on the editorial side and the advertising side. So 
all eyes on Jeff Bezos for a lot of reasons, but from a journalistic point of view, because of the Washington Post. So what about circulation? I mean, how do they get readers to pay for online content when so much content is free? There are about uh, 1,400 daily newspapers in the United States. Now about 35, getting close to 40% of them, are starting to charge readers to read digital editions. And one of the most popular, successful ways of doing that is the so-called metering system, which was pioneered by the Financial Times in London and most successfully used in the US by the New York Times. And the way it works is this. If you're a subscriber to the print edition, you get the digital edition free on any platform, your cell phone, your tablet, your laptop. Um, but if you're not a subscriber to the print edition, they will let you have 10 free stories a month, and after that, you start paying. And since the Times did this about two and a half, three years ago, they now have 800,000 people who are subscribers to the digital editions of the New York Times. These are people who do not subscribe or buy the print newspaper. And they're charging them, on average, about $200 a year. So if you do the arithmetic, uh, 800,000 people times $200 a year, you come up with $160 million a year in new revenue. This is highly significant. The, the newsroom the budget of the New York Times, what they pay to support all those reporters and writers and editors and videographers and photographers and copy editors and so on, is 200, a little over 200 million. So the New York Times is now getting new revenue, three quarters of what it costs to put out the New York Times. And the day will come when digital editions cover the whole cost of the newsroom of the New York Times. And what's really happening is the business model is changing. In the old days, 80% of the revenue came from advertisers and 20% from readers. It's now more than 50% from readers at the New York Times and many other newspapers in, in the United States. So we are seeing a change in the business model to more dependence on readers and less dependence on advertisers. So do that, does that mean they have to change, the newspapers have to change their content as well? Well, I think they do. It's partly a matter of what they don't do as well as what they do do. I'm not talking right now about the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post, which is sort of national newspapers. I'm talking about large metropolitan dailies, um, the Boston Globe, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Miami Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Dallas Morning News, papers like that. Large metropolitan newspapers in major cities that play a major role in the community. And it seems to me they can't be all things to all people. They have to really focus on local, local, local. Um, and I mean only coverage because no one can do it as well as a local paper. And this is content that is not easily available on the website. So it's very original. And it's not just the sports coverage, which most newspapers do very, very well, but City Hall, the state capitol, the art scene, the colleges, the universities, the medical centers, the movers and shakers of the community, local business, all of that is where they should put all of their effort. Now, this may sound heretical coming from a journalism school dean, but the papers like that really need a Washington bureau or overseas bureaus. Isn't that what they really do very well at NPR and The Guardian and the BBC and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Journal and some other places? So what they should do is constantly, a colleague of mine at CUNY says, newspapers should do what they do best and link to the rest. And I think that's exactly right. Um, and they should just not do certain kinds of coverage and just link to it to provide to the readers and focus their resources on what they do best. You know, there were 4,000 reporters in Rome when the new Pope was selected last year and for his investiture. 4,000 reporters from around the world. Now, does anyone think that there were 4,000 different stories that came out of Rome? It was one story repeated 4,000 times. Why did everybody have to send a report? Uh, you know, revenue is going to be very tough to come by in this digital age, and it's very, very important where you focus your resources uh, on the editorial side. So I think that's what newspapers are going to have to do, and it's to their advantage to do so. Well, that's pretty optimistic. Do you think we're going to have to print newspapers in five years? Well, I, I don't know, you know, whether it'll be five years or ten years, but we are slowly witnessing the gradual ending of the age of print for newspapers. Already, many newspapers around the country are printing only 
three days a week and rely on the web for the other days. And pretty soon, I think, some of them will give up publishing every day with the exception of Sunday, because Sunday is where the advertising is and where all those coupons are and all that. And so it's still pretty lucrative on Sunday. Uh, and that's what I think will happen. Um, you know, it's very important because revenues are hard to come by to cut analog costs in this digital age. It doesn't make a lot of sense to put a lot of money into um, printing and paper and trucks to deliver all the papers. And I think that's okay because the saving is enormous. It can be used for um, journalistic efforts. And in the end, we're not in the printing business. We're not in the paper business. We're in the journalism business. And that's where we should put our money. So finally, are your students getting jobs in Wisconsin? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Yeah, they are about um, more than 90% of them are getting jobs in journalism. We're getting, say, six months of graduation. Um, some of them are getting jobs in traditional places, doing traditional jobs, and then working at the Times and the Journal and Bloomberg and um, uh, NBC News and the New York Daily News and all over the country, actually. Some of them work in traditional places, but they're doing non traditional jobs. They're working on the website, they're working on the video unit. And finally, a whole bunch of them are working in places that did not exist five, six, seven years ago. You know, what gets lost every time you read stories about people getting laid off is that there is a parallel universe growing in journalism. There are places, um, political, pro the Huffington Post, uh, BuzzFeed, Business Insider, the Texas Tribune, the voice of San Diego are doing great jobs and they're hiring people. Um, last year, something called Inside Climate News won a Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting. And a, and a website called California Watch was a Pulitzer finalist for public service. These are the sort of new jobs, new places that didn't exist that are hiring people. So we always tell the students and when they're applying or they're concerned, I'm giving up a job to come back to graduate school at 27 years old. You know, there's going to be an opportunity for me. And we sit them down and we show them the job statistics and we say, you're going to get a job. It's going to be a different job than my generation got, but the jobs are there and you're going to end up working for a place that didn't exist three years ago. Journalism is not dying. Journalism is changing. And there's more journalism being done today and more platforms by more people than ever before. So it really is a good story. And we, you know, the students get it, and they come and they catch up. So we're very happy about that. Well, okay. Very good. So now, if anyone has any questions, more questions, so we have not asked or have not asked. Please, please. Yes. I can understand uh, in the 1960s that there was sex discrimination in the but we're talking about you know, a period now, 40 or 50 years later. And it's my opinion that really the gap in compensation has narrowed substantially between what women get versus men get. But yet I hear all the time in colleagues, because the elections are, are this year, that uh, you know, people still make the position that we want to make sure that everyone has equal pay for equal work. Leaving you, leaving you with the impression that somebody's getting through there's compensation. Barack Obama today, for instance, kind of says one of his goals is to make sure that women are paid for the same amount, the same job, uh, or, uh, same job carried out. And that's fine, I think everybody agrees with that. But what I want to ask you specifically, actually I have two questions. But the first question is, everyone talks about this theme general terms, but what specific industries and companies could you name where you believe they discriminate between men and women based? Well, it's true that the gap changes depending on jobs, but there's always a gap, even in the best paid jobs, you know, engineering, computer, where you can actually quantify things, so that's the smallest gap, it's something like 93 to 94%, it's still, there's still a gap for the same job, the same work. So. What's true is that there is there is wage gap. 
a general gap of 77 cents on the dollar that women make in general. But it closes for some of the more professional and technical um, things. But, you know, I think that, that this is a, a situation which I'll just talk, point to the latest situation where Jill Abramson, who was the editor of the New York Times, the executive editor of the New York Times, was paid less than the previous editor. Now, that's a salary payment, but she was paid less, and she felt ultimately that she went to management twice, and they raised her twice because they agreed that she should be getting paid more. And when Mary, Mary Barra came into GM, she also was paid less. She did it for something totally different. No, it was management issues. So she actually was quite a good journalist, but um, there were issues. Oh, she was a journalist. I mean, she was an editor, but she should not. Well, that's what I call it. She was a journalist, and she was a fantastic uh, investigative reporter. So she was quite a big accomplishment. I'm still on the track of my question. Are there any specific industries that you, that you recall uh, or that you have in mind that continue? And don't follow the policy people Yeah, I would say probably most of them across the board. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these statistics. And these statistics, if you look at them, are quite accurate. No one disputes that, that they do not exist. This is exactly, if you look, the, the labor people keep the statistics by every industry. And in no industry are women making 100% equal pay. Great. I, I, I don't agree with you. And I'm not I worked for a professional firm in New York for some time. I was part of a compensation committee. I could own that firm without naming the firm. I had about 53% of the, of the professional staff are women and balance of men. Okay? And the compensation that one received without regard to male or female was based on your performance. And what was that position when and there were ranges that we if this person is a senior, so to speak, she or he would be entitled to this range of compensation. So there, there are firms out there in professions that don't discriminate. Oh, uh, totally. I totally agree with you. I'm just talking about the general picture across industries is that there are pay gaps in every industry, not specific to each firm. Some firms are great on pay, but not across the industry. Yes. I have a question for Steve. Steve, can you see an example of the employment of the the one story of 4,000 paper company. But in the future, how do you see the coverage of more controversial events where you have to have different opinions about the same event? You don't think everyone, all the political papers are looking for the same story. How, does, how hard will a reader who can drive revenue have to work to get different versions of the event? Yeah, that's a good question, Chris. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of papers have Washington nose. If you look at the coverage that's coming out on an Obama press conference today, or a speech, or a vote of Congress, it's essentially the same story. Now, some papers customize their Washington reporting for their particular area they cover their congressman. That's fun. That's why I consider local reporting if you want to cover your congressman or senator. Um, so, there, the point is that in theory, it sounds great that you can you should have lots of reporters covering a story because you get a diverse spectrum of points of view. In reality, if you look at it, it doesn't happen that way. There's a herd mentality. There's, um, there's a big story that dominates and reporters all gravitate the same way. So just empirically, it doesn't support the need for that many different reporters. As long as they can get the stories by linking to credible sources. You know. um, if there's a Supreme Court decision, Let's say, and there have been a lot of important ones uh, in June <clears throat> at the end of their term. I don't see how a newspaper in Cleveland or even Chicago would do better than using the stories from the New York Times and the Federal Supreme Court. Um, they have a full, full time reporter, Benson Hell, um, and he's very, very good, as was the woman who did the job before him. And it's very exhaustive. They come back to second and third grade of analysis of the decisions. And if you look around at other newspapers that are trying to do their own report, it just isn't as good. And you sort of say, well, why are they doing that? Just take the really good stuff from the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the Times and, and, and go with it. You know, 
same thing with foreign reporting. You know, the BBC is very, very good. Um, so that would be my answer. In theory, diversity of opinion and more viewpoints and so on would produce a greater result, and in practice, it really doesn't. Now, I just want to say the difference is that the news journalism versus opinion journalism. The news journalism, if you do it by the ethical way of doing news, is pretty much going to be what Steve says, in the sense that you're reporting what people said, and this is what happened. The columnists, the opinion people, all those people on television, then tell you their opinion about what really happened. But you want to make sure that what really happened, you're getting accurate. Um, so I think that in terms of controversy, what happens is the controversy should happen in the opinion side and not in the news side. Um, and that the real, the best stories, which are really the investigative stories, are usually done, interestingly, mostly by print people still, not by television, television occasionally, but rarely. Certainly most of the really good investigative pieces are done by print journalists still, or major news so what about the cases where it's, you know, I guess uh, you know, the acts of Congress or the facts are clear, the opinion of that is there. But what about in situations, for example, a military conflict where the facts are unclear? And certain news outlets have a certain uh, set, of, set of facts and another one has a different set of facts. Is that, what's it, do you remind what's the magic number of foreign bureaus on these companies? Is that one? It really isn't, but you know, Apart from the papers that, have, that do have foreign bureaus or cover the war in Afghanistan, in fact, um, there are also a lot of new entries, new people who are doing international reporting. There's something called the Global Post, based in Boston, actually, uh, which has foreign correspondents, and usually people who live and work overseas and are doing stories. There are new ways of doing content beyond the traditional model. Um, so that makes a difference. Sometimes facts are in dispute, and a good reporter will say the facts are unclear or they're in dispute. These people think this, and these people think that. And you know, tomorrow I'll write an analytic piece, and I'll tell you what I think. But meanwhile, that's the difference of opinion. So, um, you know, good reporters will not just report what the Supreme Court said, or what Congress did, or what Obama said in the press conference. They will analyze it. I mean, much, reporting now is much more analytic. Um, and that's one of their roles, and if they're very good and they have a lot of experience, they have good contacts, and covered that institution for a long time, uh, their, their interpretation is going to be um, pretty sad, even though some people you know, might interpret it another way. That's fine. Somebody can write a different point of view. Yes, sir. Your comments so far have been well addressed to a highly educated group of people who will seek out to find these multi and various uh, sources of news. But one of the key parts of journalism is to help form an educated electorate. It used to be that the masses got most of their news from the newspapers and then there was a transition to the three networks. And so there was a great exposure to the electorate in getting it educated and informed. That model seems to have been breached now. Can you address how journalism serves that function of educating what I'll call a, a changing, perhaps lazy electorate? Yeah. Uh, the short answer to that is social media. More and more people, particularly younger people, are getting their news um, either through Google search or because a Facebook friend says, um, go read that story, uh, or they follow certain people on Twitter. Um, and somebody once said, if the news is important, it will find me, meaning somebody will tell me about it. And these days, technology has enabled people to tell a lot of other people their friends. And a lot of news is consumed that way. The New York Times, even with its metering system, will allow people to come in free if they're coming via a Google search or from Facebook. So that's what's happening now. Your question really goes to a larger point about society. That is, you know, we all meant that people don't read as much anymore and they spend all their time doing this or watching television. And, you know, this is the problem of how you educate uh, the masses of people in a 
society like the U.S. And there's no simple answer to that. But I think that you could probably argue that social media makes it more likely that less educated people will hear about news than was true um, 20 years ago, because most of those people didn't subscribe to the New York Times or the Washington Post or even the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Um, so I, I think probably it's shifting in how they get their news, but I think the question really is, are some people going to be very well informed and some people less well informed? <coughs> yes, and it always wants that question. Yeah. One of the problems with these multiple platforms is that it's not a problem like your opinion. Is that we can choose which platform, which approach we get news from. And what's happening is there are silos. And I may get all my shoes, my friends who send me links and so on, on the right. And someone else is going to get it on the left. And I'm not sure who is anymore. But uh, the fact is that we're getting Yeah, this goes to the partisanship of the United States. I mean, we live in a much more partisan society. It's not just Congress, it's the whole country. People who tend to live in neighborhoods with people who share their views and their lifestyles, um, and they tend to read certain things, as you say. And if you're a liberal, you watch MSNBC, if you're a conservative, you watch Fox, and if you don't know what you are, you watch CNN. And, and that's not good. Um, I don't see that getting better. I think it's a national problem, not just a journalistic problem. Uh, and I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Come to the next. Besides the issue of silos, yeah. the concerns we realize that the social media information isn't in any way checked. And so much unreliable stuff is getting transmitted out there, and the people are just running with it. And I don't know how you can throw that. Yeah. This is the verification issue. Uh, and right, it is a problem. Um, the editor of the New Yorker, David Remnick, um, was saying the other day that, you know, the story runs in the New Yorker is fact-checked, and they have a famous system for checking facts. Um, and when they put stories on their online edition of the New Yorker, they don't fact-check. And he was asked about that, and what he said was, well, they have one fact-checker for all the stuff they put online, and obviously can't do a lot. And his answer was, basically, it's a different medium, and, and speed becomes more important, uh, and sometimes things get through that shouldn't, despite the best efforts of an honest reporter, um, and that the advantage of this medium is that, yes, it's more likely to make a mistake in the first place than in the traditional print world, but it's also easier to get something correct, and that if it's out there and it's wrong, ten people will, will come forward and say that's not right. Um, and things get, get corrected. So that's not a great answer, it's not a great situation, but the medium is, is such that it allows anybody to put up anything they want without the practices of newspapers and magazines uh, in the traditional world. Um, and, you know, we just, it's a problem, but you have to rely basically on the self correcting mechanisms and on the, the, you learn to trust certain reporters, you know? You learn certain sources that you rely on most of the times in the New York or whatever. Um, and you learn the bylines that you can trust. And it's just a self-selecting process that it's a greater burden on us as consumers of media. It really is, but that's the only answer. Yeah, I was also going to say that there's um, an interesting, the creation of a new course in colleges called News Literacy. And they are teaching college students across the country about how to read a news article. Where is this person coming from? Do they have an agenda? Is this source trustworthy? So I think that more and more, because exactly what you said, there's so much going up and you don't know where it's coming from, and sometimes it's disguised even, that the more young people are sort of taught and realize that they have to be more sophisticated in looking at where the news is coming from, the better they'll be a judge. You have a question. Sorry, that was my question. Oh, yeah.
So, yeah, I think at some point you say, you know what, I don't have time for all this, and I'm just going to start narrowing the people I trust or I follow or the news I'm really interested in. On the other hand, you know, if you're interested in something, uh, we have a friend who's a, who was a journalist and now is working in nuclear energy. And he said he gets up every morning, and before he goes to work for an hour, he reads on the web everything in nuclear energy that comes out that day or any new studies. And he knows more about what's going on before he even gets to his office than before. So if you have specific interests, you can go deeper and deeper and broader and broader than you ever have been before. sitting here in Nantucket, you know, you can read the RS, you can read any global newspaper you want, so you can be very well. We, we follow all that's happening in the Middle East, and so you can go, you have to subscribe to them, but you can get the RS and the leading paper in Israel, and very liberal, and very anti-government, Israeli government policies. And, you know, 10 years ago, here I am in the United States, and I didn't be reading it. I did, I did it three days later. Uh, and now you can go and read their English language edition and find out what they're saying, you know, in the comfort of your own room or walking down the street in their time. It's just amazing. Now, it's true, there's a lot that's overwhelming, but you just have to be selective in what you need to follow and what you're interested in. Yeah? I don't know how many news Google. Google We should all have that problem. 70% <laughs> um, of the advertising revenue that is in the media world or related to media goes not to news media companies, but goes to technology companies, the principal one being Google. They are making money hand over fist because there are ads served every time somebody does a Google search or goes to Google News. And increasingly, the ads are served to you based on your interest, your demographic profile, your web viewing habits, your web buying habits. They know who you are, and they're targeting ads to you, and they're making a lot of money. But it's not from Google News, because I see nothing here. I just go to Google News, and there's a yeah. list of... Uh, they're making the money mostly from search, that's true. But believe me, it pays for... It pays for all this. Does the student membership in Cooney School of Journalism increasing? Well, it's a graduate program. It's a year and a half, and we have about 100 students coming uh, in every September. Um, and that's, we're not going to get any bigger. Um, uh, we think that's a good sign. It can be very hands on, it can be very personal. It's a very intimate school. If you're ever in New York, you should come see it here in Times Square or right in the middle of the next door to the New York Times. Um, and it's nice and small. Everybody knows everybody. It's intimate. It's a great learning environment. So we're going to stay that size. Yes. Um, two questions, um, one for Stephen and one for Lynn. Um, Stephen, you mentioned um, the herd mentality um, in journalism. And are you addressing that at all in your graduate program? And, um, and Lynn, for you, um, women's colleges used to be kind of the, the hotbed of feminism. And they brought us Madam Albright, Hillary Clinton. Um, do you still see a place for single sex education? Well, you go first. Um, I do see a place for it. I mean, I went to a single sex school. I went to Vassar College, and it's now co-ed, probably because of its financial service. Um, that women didn't give as much to their colleges as men did to their colleges. Um, and uh, it's proved to be a very vital place. But I would argue very strenuously still for women's colleges. I think that um, they're extremely valuable not only great education, but important role models for women in the classrooms. I mean, they always say you know, that women hold back raising their hands and all of those things. Seeing women professors, I have a friend who went to graduate in the early 1960s where all of her courses were in Harvard. She never had a female professor for her four years at Radcliffe. Now, 
things have changed a lot, so there are real reasons, I think, for what the most schools. Um, but when I go to college campuses, it's interesting to me that feminism, I mean, yes, they all have women's issues, feminist clubs, um, but the issue on campuses is LGBT. It is their civil rights issue, as ours may have been raised for, for the women's movement. And uh, it's where all of the action is going, the discussion is going. It's, it's a whole other generation. It's really interesting, and it different instance. Now I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the current mentality, and how do you address it in graduate school? Yeah. Um, the single most important thing we tell that is to be original in your analysis of the story and try to be smart and also go do stories that haven't done before that is enterprise journalism. Um, because by definition, the story that have been told before, there's no heard, you're the first one. Um, and that's all you can say, uh, because there are certain events that are covered by everybody and you do the best you can. Um, probably not going to distinguish yourself on those stories. You can distinguish yourself on the enterprise and investigative stories that you do, the original stories. That's the single most important thing to know today is we need more original stories. Stories that hold people accountable, stories that break news, stories that you didn't know until you opened the paper or saw it online. Um, because too much is all the same. And that's part of the consumption problem. Part of the reason that this overload is this, you know, you know, there's a lot of the same stuff or slightly different take on it, but not meaningfully different. And so we try to stress, you know, be original when you can be original, be enterprising. And that's all I can say about it because it is a problem. Yeah. There's a little off topic, but I see you did mention sports coverage. You're a professor at Georgia. My dad died in 1998, but he wrote the sports columns for the Washington Post for 75 years. He wrote for 75 years. Um, uh, from 1923 until he died in 1998. Um, so his life was basically the 20th century sports he wrote about um, the whole era. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, in 2005, his columns had never been collected. So my brothers and I published a book of his columns called All Those Mornings at the Post. Um, and he was a great influence on me and um, many of my family that followed him to journalism. He was a great man, a great dad. And our son, when he was a little kid, he was a baseball fan. He was amazed that Papa, he called him new baby. <laughs> well, it is my love. <laughs> Well, you've been a great audience. Thank you so much for coming out tonight.